Welcome to Catholic Homeschool Radio, where we begin conversations to help parents enrich their lives and make practical decisions for the future. Hi friends, welcome once again to Catholic Homeschool Radio. I'm Priscilla McCaffrey, and I'm very happy you have checked in to listen to another topic for homeschooling parents. And just because we are talking about classical education in schools does not exclude you. We should all be interested in this topic. I first came to the idea of homeschooling when I was a reader for Conservative Book Club in the mid-80s. They were successfully cultivating a new demographic. Those stalwarts who were teaching their children at home, um, by the 90s, there was, such, uh, there was much interest in classical education among Protestants, and then a most happy reunion, I would say, between classical education and Catholics. This was pre- uh, I would say this was precipitated in part by young people graduating from the Catholic colleges that were heavy with the great books. They were pulling their children out of schools for lots of reasons. Laura Burquist, a graduate of Thomas Aquinas College, was beginning to implement the principles of classical education. And uh, I guess probably thousands of children now have been introduced painlessly to her very solid educational programs. She uh, rooted her, her program in the trivium, which relates studies to the brain capacities of different ages. She had memory work for the early years, reasoned argument for the middle years, on up to rhetorical practice for later years. While the burden of education is great, it is no longer a desert. There is a lot out there to help teach or supplement our children's education. So I think we're in a very interesting time. It's a time of ferment with all sorts of things percolating and giving life to education. I think that has a lot to do with all the homeschooling parents uh, who have just decided that they were going to take control of their kids' education. Um, They've been around now for a full generation, and they've been working hard at that soil. And many of your children will be preparing for jobs in, uh, guess what, educational institutions. And no doubt a lot of these kids will want to homeschool their own. But I think for many, they will find the transition fairly agreeable to a brick-and-mortar school. So that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about today. Um, and I, I think that the homeschool generation will have a lot to bring to students in desks. Uh, today I have with me two moms who have homeschooled their nine children between them. Uh, they've done that for many years. And I'm going to tell you that it seems like almost on a whim, they decided, hey, let's start a school. But um they're not whimsical. They have these solid uh, backgrounds and uh, a, an excellent appreciation of, uh, of classical education. And um, over the last year, they've had a, a, well, I guess they started off with 12 kids and now they have 17. And they ha- do have lots of interest. Of course, there are all sorts of problems uh, holding people back. There's always transportation, the logistics, and money. But nevertheless, um, we want to hear about their program and how they, and in uh, probably the second part of this, uh, we will discuss how that came about. So uh, these are moms who love classical education and they know how to use it. Welcome Pip Donahoe and Eileen Kohatch. Kocha. Kocha. I'm sorry. Thanks so much for talking with me today. Oh, it's great to be here. Um, They're both ladies uh, from New Jersey. Do you live close to each other? We're in the same county, so not too far, about a half hour. And uh, how far is your school from you, Eileen? Um, About a half hour because it is here in Chatham, New Jersey. Okay. So, Pip, that's great for you. It's wonderful for me. Oh, lucky. (laughs) I feel guilty. (laughs) Well, Pip and I go back a long way to Thomas Aquinas College. And so I know Pip, and when she told me she she got this friend who insisted that they start a school, <laughs> I thought, wow, if that friend is, is on to this and she's on to Pip, then this is going to be something very solid, very fast. So it does not surprise me that you threw yourself into this and that the kids were responsive and uh, the, the parents so grateful. 
So can you lay out for our listeners what your background is and how that prepared you to homeschool and then start a school? And it has to start with your days back on the farm when you were a little <laughs> girl in Oregon. Chasing rabbits. <laughs> um, I, I have been um, constantly grateful and and amazed at what I was given as a child. Um, we just had Wyoming. We, we have colleges come to the students to, to you know, lib, uh, Catholic classical colleges to, to talk about their colleges. And we just had Wyoming Catholic College out and they were talking about their backpacking program. And, and I was thinking, gosh, I did all that. So <laughs> I, I had this wonderful formation, um, starting with the farm, backpacking out in the wilderness that I took so much for granted and that I see now that students have to go to get that experience, and I was given that. So I was given a wonderful background in the natural world. Um, and at the same time, because of my parents, I was given a background in, in the importance of the intellectual life and the place of the church in that, that um, they went hand in hand. And then, of course, um, my parents, with their foresight, uh, saw the beginning of Thomas Aquinas College, and that's where they wanted me to go. Yeah, we went in the old days. We were in the old, the old <laughs> campus. We're the pioneers. Yeah. That's right. We were the pioneers. It was beautiful. Wonder, yeah. It was a wonderful experience, and the changed my life and gave me the formation um, that for my life that made me feel that I could do whatever I thought I should do, mm -hmm. pursue job-wise, intellectually, wh whatever it was. I really did have that confidence from that college mm -hmm. education. And, and of course, uh, you were editor of the Faith and Life series, so that had to give you a, a very firm idea of what Catholic education was about and what the needs are out there. Right. From graduate school that we were both in together, um, it certainly helped me to see what the issues were, what was, what was going wrong, what needed to be fixed, what needed to be given to the children. And then doing the series obviously threw me into that. Um, and then having to work with both the school situation and the, the parents that wanted to teach their children at home um, what the, the needs were. Mm -hmm. um, so I was involved in that. And then with my later work, more with uh, working with adults, education for adults, um, seeing the huge lack of any intellectual formation. Oh. Uh, the majority of, of people, I would uh, say. Among successful uh, people, among you're talking about educa so-called educated. Educated people that were successful in their careers, but really lacked uh, uh, any solid Catholic intellectual formation. Yeah. And they wanted it. It, it wasn't that they didn't see that mm -hmm. as important. They just didn't have it. Yeah. And, um, they wanted it. We've been talking uh, in this series also about uh, lifelong learning and there are more and more programs out there. It, it, that's why I th say things are percolating. Oh, There's a lot going on. Um, so much more than when you think back when we were in graduate school. Do, do mm -hmm. you remember Father Harden, who, who yes. you worked for his Catholic reading plan? I don't know if you worked on that book. I remember doing a little bit on it. He has a Catholic reading plan, and that was that was new. I mean, no one mm -hmm. else had that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, uh, outside of the Mortimer Adler, uh, the secular uh, great books program. Right. This was for Catholics, what yeah. every Catholic should yeah. have, should read. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and so there's so much more now and, and so the, the internet online classes and, and things you can do. So that certainly there's much more available, I think, because people started to see they hadn't been educated mm -hmm. and they wanted it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It doesn't have to end at any time. I, I remember Dr. MacArthur saying to me, you're a student the rest of your life, right? You know, and and I, I was so glad he said that to me because it wasn't all done in four years, <laughs> and I didn't have to assume that that's that was my grade for life, and that was, uh, you know, there was there's just so much more, right. and that's one thing that he gave us, and um, all those professors did at TC. Eileen, um, we've just met, and uh, I'm going to say that you're you've made this look easy starting a school, so. How come? How did this happen, and how were you prepared to start a classical program? Um, I think I just <clears throat> eventually fell into classical education. Uh, when I decided to homeschool my children, um, first I just had three, um, the oldest being eight. I went. I slowly got into the Colby program uh, from Napa. And I really didn't understand what classical education was, mm -hmm. but I just decided, well, it here it is all laid out for me. And I do have, <clears throat> I did have a teaching background. Uh, I, so can I, 
yes. I, I think that does help because I, I taught for three years too, and there's or four years. There's you're realistic about what happens during the day. You have twenty kids in your class to thirty. There's time, so much time taken up with. Uh, just the the logistics of moving around, uh, taking books out, going to another class, reprimanding people, taking, uh, uh, taking um, whether <laughs> absentee and um, putting together all the you know the papers that kids don't get, and um, yes. So then you realize you know it's I could teach a child you know in, in half an hour what might take a morning. In third grade, for instance, and not, it wouldn't be the same in the older, later years. Yes. Yeah. So, um, no background does help, but it, it it shouldn't hinder anyone just because they don't have a, a teaching background or yeah. even a college education, right. because there's so much there available now for um, for the parent to teach their their children. Um, so then we we you know moved around. We went to study. My husband went to do advanced studies in in theology in, in Austria at the International oh. Theological Institute. And that's where I started to meet people from Thomas Aquinas. Oh, uh-huh. And, uh, and even people from Ave Maria, students for Ave Maria and, and some faculty and from Franciscan University. And I was more and more exposed to what this was, uh, what this was, classical education, even though I was having it with my own kids. And in fact, I was such so much more rigorous with my, my own children. Uh-huh. <laughs> that people were coming to me and asking me to to help them with writing. Can I help them with math? Ah, uh-huh. So, um, which of course I didn't help them with because I had my own <laughs> own issues here, my own my own family to deal with. Mm-hmm. And then we, after my husband was finished, we went to help with Wyoming Catholic College. My husband oh, got I didn't the know that. got the uh, he was the admissions. Uh, director that for those first three years so mm-hmm. that those first three years we were there and I was the um helped out with the library and collecting books for the library um ordering books for the students so more and more I I was getting it and I said to myself this is something I'd like to do for high school I saw my kids were more educated than I was mm-hmm. um but I'm not I wasn't ready yet mm-hmm. and when we came back to the East Coast, because we are from New Jersey, um, this was my opportunity to enroll at St. John's College in Annapolis, where I said, okay, I'm going to f- intellectually prepare myself. They have a, a program yes. online? No, they have a graduate institute, um, which I went to over the summer. In, oh, for the fantastic. Summers, for the, okay. it was a summer program. In, in Annapolis. So I had to go eight weeks every summer oh. for four summers. Uh-huh. And at this time- Good my, for you. My my kids were a little bit, you know, I had two at Thomas Aquinas at this point or one of them. The other ones were in high schools that and they could help out. And I would not have been able to do it if they, my husband and, and my older daughters, um, if they didn't help me. Mm-hmm. So, um, and my second, I so I finished that program in 2014. But in 2013 is when someone asked me, actually one of our board members who agreed to be a board member eventually mm-hmm. said, What's stopping you from starting a school now? (laughs) And I said, I need to write a mission statement. And after I said that, I thought, that's ridiculous that I'm not going to start a school unless I have a mission statement. (laughs) So I went home and wrote a mission statement. And he helped me. And His name is Ron Colombo. He uh, he helped me. And Pip helped write that. And my husband, Mario, helped write the Mm -hmm. the, what you see now on the the website. Mm -hmm. Do Do you have that in front of you, the mission statement? Um, or should we get it later? We'd have to get it later. Okay, we'll get it later. Um, so uh, we're gonna let's talk a little bit more about education. Then we can be more specific about your program. Um, and you know, sometimes I feel people define cl- uh, their product as classical because they've thrown a, a little Latin into the program, and other people think you know classical education is uh, the superfood now of education. There's something very wholesome and uh, about it, but but still, I, I, people are kind of confused as to what it exactly is. So, um, so let's let's talk about what what it is. What is what do you hope to achieve through? We'll say twelve years. Uh, are you starting at no? You're sixth you're, grade. you're sixth, sixth grade. Sixth okay, grade. that that would be enough. Uh, sixth to twelfth would be fantastic. 
Um, well, the what first, are your goals? The first, and- w- 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 just a d- definition of classical and, and liberal arts. It seems to me there's a, a great misunderstanding, not just at the this level, but at the college level, of what a liberal arts education is. And most people think of it as, as humanities. You read a lot of literature. You may read the, the classics, Homer and, and Dante. Um, but liberal arts education, the liberal arts are uh, actually more tools than an end in themselves. Mm-hmm. And if, if that isn't at the heart of your education, then it seems to me you're going to miss a lot. So the trivium and the quadrivium, um, you need to have those tools. And, and those tools are based on the nature of man. What's, how does man's mind work? What's the best way to develop his mind so that he's able to use it? And why is it called liberal? Because it's to make, um, it's an education for a free man. So a man can determine his own life. Uh, versus a slave, someone whose life is determined by someone else. So it seems to me that has to be at the heart of it. If you don't have that, then you're not doing classical education Mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, Yeah, so aside from the specifics, right, Mm -hmm. studying um, classical literature, classical history, Euclid, and then everything else that follows, right, the medieval stuff, modern stuff, that that's because because classical education has to be um, dynamic, right? We have to bring in. It's not purely classical in the sense of ancient, ancient, yeah, right. So aside from those things that we study, it's also an education in virtue. Mm-hmm. It's an opportunity to learn from the from the from the from the. I don't want to say the great books, but really the the Why the, not? the thing. Okay, <laughs> the great the, thinkers, the great <laughs> thinkers of our yeah. culture, and to draw wisdom at the you know, draw wisdom. We're not going to be wise as soon as we finish. I, and mm-hmm. I say that to the students no, all the time. You're not getting the tools. Right. You're, you're, you're at the, you're at the beginning of, of you're, you're ready to now mm-hmm. to really be that student yeah. of, of, of life, whatever you want to, yeah. you're ready to learn. I, I do. I, I know that problem with a, a program rich in the humanities, as opposed to a program with the classical education, because it means that pain, the painful study for some people of math and science. Yes. <laughs> so uh, l- let's um, let's talk a little bit about exactly what the science entails, because I I think if if some people did some of these uh, uh, science programs, it would be so painless to them that they wouldn't even know that they were doing science. science. <laughs> they would think they're just frolicking with nature. But you, you right. wanna... uh, the mo- modern education, the STEM education, core curriculum, all of that, you know, the, 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 the math and science where um, with liberal, liberal arts, you know, the mathematics are, are part of the tools. It's not an end in itself where science, you have science, um, not just physical science, but philosophy and theology being sciences also. So if you treat the physical sciences or, or start to see them in line with those, I think you have a better uh, approach to them and certainly a better feel for them. They're not um, as scary, mm-hmm. so to speak. You wanna, then, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you to uh, give us some, idea, some ideas of what you would do with them in physics physical right. science but right so ahead. so then it, so so if you look at the the tools particularly the mathematic as a tool to help aid you that then it did the science a study of the science so um for science physical science is what well, modern science um the first thing we need to do is look at the real world around us which so many people and children don't i love that and um we are very interested in doing that and developing our science classes. So with our middle school children, our, all of our sciences are like astronomy, meteorology, botany, uh, magnitude, those kind of topics um, to get them to observe the world around them. Mm-hmm. To start to measure, that's obviously a huge part of science, start to measure the world mm-hmm. around them. And then by freshman year, um, to be a little more philosophic or reflective by reading Fabre and looking at insects, using insects, to start observing behavior of animals mm-hmm. um, and to start so, to think about that. So this is, um, so when you're doing that, you're beginning to look at nature and and decide what nature actually is. And then eventually that helps them to understand that they have a nature that they have to examine and that their life has 
should be in accord with their nature in some way. And that, that, that's, uh, that is the remarkable thing of, with the science program I know at Thomas Aquinas College and, um, you know, to look at insects and so that you can see what nature, what nature is and what it does. It's, it's such a huge problem now for, for the world around us that people don't even know what nature is. And that's why we're having these ridiculous conversations about whether the little boy can go to the little girl's room right. uh, because they don't know what nature is. So the, the um, things yeah. have a nature. If, if our kids come out with nothing else, yeah, they'll no. be educated if, if they're able to do that. And there's easy ways to do that. I say the Fabra is, is marvelous because a huge discussion is about instinct. So he's always comparing mm-hmm. the, the human um, with the animal. And um, for them to start having those discussions and to start thinking about that, that they're, they're then going to ask, what's the nature of man? What's our nature and what's appropriate for us? Mm-hmm. Um, and and that is is complemented when we study history and literature because we are always talking about um, that that aspect of you know the nature of man or what the human condition is. So mm-hmm. it it seems to me that it's um, there's that there's a there's a nice thread that goes through mm-hmm. um, all the subject areas, um, even in the harder. You yeah. know, because we can't get away from physics and chemistry and not get away, not that we should get away, but these are things that we, we need to offer, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we need to offer those things. And parents need to know that we take science seriously in the way that maybe the world um, takes it seriously. Yeah. And we do take it seriously. Yeah. We, uh, it's we, mandatory. We take it so seriously because we want them to have the proper foundation so they can really do physics well. Mm-hmm. And they can do biology well because they have a better understanding of the natural world. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. it, it will help them do modern science better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there seem to be no parameters now in in the world of science. Uh, whatever you want to do research in, you just go ahead and do research in. I'm uh, I'm being a little facetious, but um, they don't seem to be asking other the more important questions like is you know they're they're dealing with all these things about cloning and um but uh and stem cell transplants and and it's wonderful to have knowledge of these things but but isn't there any kind of a discussion as to whether or not <laughs> this is a good way to go this is a good investigation to make and for what purpose you know your 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 work is um, yeah, we definitely need, uh, I guess, uh, a scientist with a little philosophy behind him. Um, I know I talked to a doctor once, I was asking him the reason why something happened. And, uh, he, he gave me the, all the chemical explanation. I said, no, no, no. I, I just want to know why this happens. Why, why nature works in this way? You know, what's the final end? What does, what do we get out of it since that our body works in this way? He said, oh, I never was good in philosophy. So, which. <laughs> That's right. That's not philosophy. It's uh, just, well, I would have, how yeah. does the body work? I know. And not a- um, Absolutely. I, I wish, I wish he had thought about it a little bit, but he, he, oh, well, he was a good, he was, good on points. So <laughs> I had to give them a pass. So um, how are your kids responding to math and science? How are the students? How does that go? Do, are they relieved to get into literature or uh, are they kind of It's interesting because um, these are just regular, you know, they're regular children like yours, mm-hmm. um, like the kid next door. So some some of them have you know, math is very, it's, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. And for some of them, math is easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a parent who, who who spoke to me about how, oh, all those other subjects, literature and history, theology, those are easy. It's the math that's hard. And I, 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 I for the first time I could turn around, I said, well, not really. You know, the, the mathematics is, you know, like algebra and Euclid. Mm-hmm. That's pretty straightforward. I mean, there's, you know, you have to think about it, mm-hmm. but it's straightforward. There's an argument there that's cl- can be clear, mm-hmm. or can be made to be clear to the to the to the student or to the teacher. Um, so I think they 
for some of them, actually, the literature is is more of the harder or the history or the yeah. Are you having them write much in yes. your literature course? Yes. Pa- do, you, do you call be- it grammar or literature? Um, when as you set up the program, is it? I mean, or English studies, and then you divide no. it into grammar. No, and literature, no, no. Or? It's, we have a writing program. Okay. Then we also teach Latin and Greek. So that oh, okay. so, so that's, that's grammar is built in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have actually a writing program. So we have writing twice a week, and we work on. Um, their writing skills as as they relate to the subject matter that they're studying in whatever in mm-hmm. theology, hi- history, literature, whatever they whatever happens to be the topic of the for the for the assignment, they also our older child our older students juniors and seniors write a thesis, so they're already. Um, oh, that's good. Yeah, it's how, they, how long is that thesis? It's five pages about. Okay, and they use um, we've been using Saint Thomas's. Um, Format, you know, where the who's with the objection is that? That's oh, in the writing. To, oh, 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 you mean oh, Thomas Aquinas oh, format oh, you, you for them uh, too. Oh, that's the interesting. Idea. So, objections so they the have juniors. to present an argument yes. and uh, and they have to and, defend it publicly. In oh, front that's of the wonderful. What were some of your uh, selections this year? How many how many seniors did you have last year? We had one senior, and, and then we had, did you have the we juniors do that? Three too? juniors. Okay, can you tell me what? Well, uh, Teresa was uh, our senior, mm-hmm. and she did um, friendship in Brideshead Revisited. Oh my Whether goodness Charles gracious! A That's a tough one. It, it was. was. It was very it was. tough. You um, know, <laughs> but it was great that she she had to work through that, and so um, she had to understand friendship, the teaching on friendship from Aristotle and and um, some of Saint Thomas, and then square it with the book and his development and. I'm going to reveal here that one of the professors at Wyoming Catholic College has never read. Brides have revisited. Oh, she doesn't like wall. Oh. So I found that so interesting. And um, and I think that there's a wrinkle in her perspective <laughs> of education. Um, so she that would be great for her to. Yeah. So that was our first read, uh, our first senior. And, and, and then, and the, then we, the juniors did. did um, because it was our first year, we couldn't draw a lot on our, our studies. Right. right. Least, mm-hmm. So um, one of them did uh, the. On, he he worked on the the um, PEDs on um, drug enhancements, uh, performance enhancing drugs. Oh yeah, oh golly, because uh, the, the juniors and seniors were doing uh, Aristotle's ethics. Yes, so okay. these were ethical questions. Uh, the two we had two that were yes. ethical mm-hmm. questions. Three, uh, one was on um, yeah. on uh, internet surveillance. Oh, and okay. this was all whether inter- internet surveillance Those are all was, was was difficult topics, uh, ethical. ethical, and then the a lot another person young. One of the young ladies wrote on. Um, she wrote on the abortion issue, but whether the the exceptions, the exceptions, exceptions. were, were okay. Were, were, so she actually wrote on on yeah. those. Okay, I you know I, a lot of programs, um, a lot of public schools will take your the, the honor students and take the, you know the more talented kids, if we can still make that kind of comparison, um, and. They'll have them do these kinds of papers and deal with these issues. How is it going to be different with your program and their program of uh, developing critical skills and rooting out falsehoods? You know, what's the end product in your in your school that will be different from a, a public school kid? Um, well, they're not going to have free reign on on. On, what, topics. on topics, yeah, already that's, the first thing. that's right. Already we're, they're dealing with we're, we're um, Catholic, yeah, yeah. And, and, and in fact, one of the kids they did want to write on. Um, we're thinking about it now. They don't have to actually present their proposals yet mm-hmm. um, on you know same sex quote marriage, mm-hmm. and uh, we talked about it at the faculty, and we decided not to, for them not to even. They can talk about marriage. Mm-hmm. But we don't want to bring them to a place that maybe they're not even ready to argue right. properly. Who, yeah, right. Who wants to talk about that? No. I, I and, do understand that. Yeah. And we yeah. have younger students that yeah. come to the and defenses, they, they, yes. and we didn't think that was appropriate. So, but, and but there's also uh, this, and that that is, you do believe that all all their work will somehow get them to the truth. Yes. And and I I have the impression with a lot of the. Um, the universities and the, unfortunately the high schools that start so young that they're they're teaching the kids to be clever but not to come to truth because they that's almost one of the things that they start off with is uh, you, you we really can't finally know and so it's good to develop your skills um but 
they become consequently, you know, skeptics and, and really enemies of truth because they, you know, so your kids are all out, you know, ready to make these arguments and other people are, you know, they'll listen to them, but they don't, it doesn't occur to them that, that they should come to a truth and then embrace it. Maybe that the truth calls them to something in particular. So I, I think that's one of the differences between, um, Annapolis, St. John's, um, program of the great books and Thomas Aquinas college is that, uh, really there's, there's always the hope that you can embrace that final truth. And then you, you kind of learn through the program, how you arrive at truth, um, on, diff on different levels, like in math or philosophy, in the different sciences. theology, right. right. Yeah, they, they, and they that expect, doesn't make them invalid if right, it's not like that. They expect in, in modern sciences to get to some kind of truth, as in something that will work, something that mm. will cure a disease, but they don't see that in the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. It's just in that area, but not everything else is up for grabs mm -hmm. and, and not just not knowable, yeah. but they think we can know in math and science. Yeah. So it's it's such a disconnect and that, in their own lives. And that um, you're a better citizen if you give people kind of space to come to their own truth. Right. And that's so <clears throat> destructive. And I, I hate how that starts so early with the kids. And I think that's one reason a lot of us pulled kids out of school uh, so that we could give our kids, show our kids what's going It goes back to do, do things have a nature, finally. Yeah, yeah. And if you deny that, then you, you're right. It, you, you, there is no truth. And but it, if you do believe things have a nature, it's no, and it's knowable, maybe not completely, but a part of it and a lot of it, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's what the critical thinking is about, so that you're able to discern that. Yeah. Okay, we're going we're gonna to stop here and uh, start shortly, and I hope you'll stay with us. Thank you.